are so anxious to hear your spirit talking to us. We already have been hearing you all through this service telling us what you want to do for us, what you have done for us in Jesus, giving us hope, giving us courage, reminding us that we're precious to you, showing us that nothing is too hard for you. Thank you for all these wonderful things you've spoken now. Speak some more through your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, about three years ago, I was uh, in a hospital in Modesto, California. Uh, <clears throat> I was not a patient, thankfully. I have been blessed to have very, very little medical things in my life, and I know my turn is coming, but we put it off as long as we can, don't we? Anyway, I was in the hospital because my father had experienced a terrible motorcycle accident. He's been a motorcycle enthusiast all his life, and uh, my wife found out out before we got married, and she made it one of the conditions of our getting married that I would not get a motorcycle. So you can see that I was whipped from the beginning. <laughs> but now, of course, she, she, she waves this in my face about my dad. You know, he was a motorcycle enthusiast from age 13 up till about whenever he had his accident. I think he was 78. And she said, see? Isn't that a wonderful wifely thing that we hear sometimes? See? <laughs> anyway, um, it was terrible. He, uh, he did something you cannot do when you're riding a motorcycle. He's a very good motorcyclist, didn't take chances, probably would still be riding to this day. But he fell asleep while he was riding. And you know, you can't do that on a motorcycle. Even in a car, it can be pretty serious. But on a motorcycle, it's even more serious. And there were reasons for that, which I won't go into at all, but I was standing by his side in the hospital expecting him to die. He was hanging on to life by a thread. He had his pelvis majorly crushed, and so he lost his legs, and they, uh, his, his breathing shut down, and his, his digestion shut down, of course, his, his vision, his hearing, he was basically going to a coma. And I didn't even know if he could really hear me or know that I was there. But they say that people can pick up quite a bit from a visit, even if they don't seem responsive. And that certainly turned out to be the case in my dad's situation, because later on, he told me what I had said to him. He said, you read John chapter 10 to me. And he said, you seem to be preparing me for the hereafter. <laughs> and I had to plead guilty because I thought he was dying, and so did everybody else. All the doctors thought so too. And what should a son do for his father but to share with him words of hope and uh, assurance for the coming uh, resurrection. So I wanted to do that. But uh, those words there just uh, came into my mind in a new way and have meant so much to me ever since from John chapter 10. And as we're lifting up Jesus, I want to share them with you because Jesus is, is picturing himself here in a way that I believe we really all need to see. This is the chapter about Jesus, the true shepherd. And I would love to spend a lot of time on every verse in the first two thirds of this chapter, but I'm not going to, because we just can't do it. But I want to just quickly read the first six verses. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. 
But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out, clearly contrasting himself with the devil who will invade your life, versus Jesus, the true shepherd, who comes in by the door. And he brings out his own sheep, and he goes before them. How does he go? Before them. Instead of pushing them, he leads them, right? And I've seen those shepherds in the Middle East, how they do that. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Well, he comments further on those same points as we go on through the chapter. So I won't say more at this point about those points. Verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Did you ever have an English teacher who told you not to mix your metaphors? And yet Jesus has just done it. First of all, he says he has to come in through the door in order to be the shepherd. And then he says he is the shepherd. And then he says he's the door. So which is it? All of the above, right? And many more things. Jesus used many metaphors to describe himself. And I love this door metaphor. Jesus is the door. Does it say there that he is a door? No. Now, are we just saying that faith in Jesus is the door? Like if I just believe that Jesus is the Son of God and died for my sins, that's the door? I think it's more than that. I think Jesus is really a door. You know, when he was torn on Calvary, there was a corresponding tear in the door that took place in the sanctuary. Remember that? I believe that Jesus is the door. In other words, we need to literally enter into the very life of Jesus. You've heard about abiding in him? Our creator. That's right. And let that life of Jesus enter into us as we pass into the kingdom. Jesus is not just, it's not just the religion of Christianity that is the only way of salvation. That may be true. But you know that the great truth here is that Jesus personally is the way. And so everything depends on how we're connecting with and interacting with Jesus. Do you agree with me? Is that true? You don't seem very enthusiastic about it. Are you glad that that's true? Would you, would you rather have another way to get in? You know that millions are trying to get in by good works. Is it possible to get in by good works? Why not? It's a failed process, all right. <laughs> but, but there's two really good reasons. Nobody's had 100% good works from birth, right? So even if we had 100% good works from now to the day we die, we still couldn't get in by, because our, we'd have bad works in our, in our record. So we have to get in through him. But besides that, I don't know anybody who's got 100% good works today, do you? There probably is somebody somewhere. I always have to leave that in that category. But Jesus Christ is the only one whose love and unselfishness are perfect. Amen? Amen? And we need to enter into him because he's the only one who's qualified to go into the kingdom. Is that true? Amen. Now, I fully believe that he will ultimately make us all just as unselfish and loving as he is. And I see him working on me every day. <clears throat> That's part of that motorcycle thing, you know. Guys, we all have to get... We all have to get down to where we don't have that self-confidence. Isn't it true? To where our confidence is in Jesus only. All of us need to get there. Because that's the truth. You may see, be sitting here today thinking, I'm the worst sinner in the congregation this morning. If that's true of you, I'll bet you anything there's several of you, you should make a little club. Listen to me. It's not about how much of a sinner you are. It's about how much righteousness Jesus has. Amen. Isn't that the truth? 
He is the door. Is there anybody that can't go in through the door? Isn't that crazy? You tell me the worst person who's caused the most harm and the most damage in this world, who's just gone through the world swashbuckling in anger and revolt, and that that person can still go through the door? They can, if they want to. Of course, going in through that door is going to have a life-changing effect upon them, but they can go through the door. Everybody can go through the door. That's why it's so fun to be a gospel minister and to be able to say to everybody, you know, you can come in. Isn't that great? You can come in. Because Jesus didn't close the door to anyone. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, that's a little different door, but it's very much related to door as well. I will come in. All right, so he says, I am the door. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Well, that's a very interesting premise. It suggests that Jesus has sheep even before they know him. How do you like the thought of God looking at you as a sheep? really not too flattering. I'm sure that someone would differ with me on this, but I think sheep are dumb. Because all my encounters with sheep have not shown them to have much intelligence. But I'll tell you one thing, they're smart enough to stay away from you if you're not the shepherd. Have you ever noticed when you go into a sheep pen how they manage, without looking hurried, to stay as far away from you as possible if you're not one of their, one of their friends? You notice that? They're just amazingly good at that. And it's really pretty hard to catch one, unless they've been really domesticated. <laughs> They're smart enough to do that. But um, he suggests here that, that everybody is a sheep. And that means we're pretty dumb and we're pretty helpless. Because even in biblical times, they were not independent creatures. And he says, uh, those who came before me were thieves. Now, I, want to, I don't want to... And we could do a whole sermon just on this next couple of verses. I don't want to do that. But I do want to point out what he says in verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal. Now please notice this. Any other shepherd. Are there other shepherds? We're not even necessarily talking about human beings. There are other things that would lead your life. Is that true? Even... Greed can lead your life. Even legitimate uh, career can become the primary guiding system in your life. A career path. Has that ever happened to anybody? Relationships can become, of course, the other shepherd in your life. They're controlling you and making you go in certain directions and do certain things and think certain things. Obviously, uh, you could be guided by anything that becomes a, a force to direct your life. For some people, it might be sports. For some people, it might be uh, a hobby of some kind. Yeah, I knew a lady who was buying new curio cabinets every few months. So she'd have more room for her collection, her collector items, you know. And she was trying to get all of a certain series. You know they make sure that those series never run out. You can't get all of them. She was looking for the rare ones. Some of them cost hundreds of dollars because they were rare by that time. And she'd get them and she'd put them in the cabinet. Aha, now I've got them all. But no, she didn't. New ones were being published and put out and created. And so she had to have more curio cabinets. And finally the day came when she was on her deathbed. And she had all of them up to that point. How satisfying do you suppose that was? When you were on your deathbed. Anything can become a false shepherd. And what do false shepherds do? Look at this. They steal, they kill, and they destroy. Is there any exception to that? You've got to have some things in your life, but as soon as they become a shepherd to you, what's that mean? As soon as you follow them. As soon as they begin to set the path of your life. They are all thieves made to kill and destroy. That's what it says. All of them. 
In other words, there's only one person who's safe to follow. Amen? Amen. We better know we're following Jesus. Where are you headed? Well, I'm headed over here. Are you sure Jesus is leading you there? Oh, that's a good question. Where are you headed? What are you doing? Well, I'm doing this. Well, are you sure Jesus wants you to do that? Because the outcome of all the rest of them, no matter how satisfying they may be temporarily, is the death and destruction. And then look at the conclusion of this verse, one of the great verses of the Bible. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. How do those false shepherds work? Don't they all promise to offer us more life? More abundant life? I know that I have an abundant life because my house is full. Is that, the, is that an abundant life? I have an abundant life because my refrigerator and my pantry are full. I have an abundant life because I have a late model car. Is that it? But you know, none of those things really satisfy or really produce life. In fact, we have discovered that the more things we own, the more things own us. How many of you have discovered that? Yeah, and then it has to be winterized, and then it has to be summarized, and then it has to be kept up and maintained, and then it has to be painted, and then it has to be polished, and then it has to be dusted, and then it has to be cleaned, and then what? And so, I'm not an anti-materialist. I just want to be sure that Jesus is my shepherd. Amen. 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 And nothing else. And I've found that when I've gotten off the track, it doesn't take too long to know it. Because pretty soon, my emotions are suffering, my health is suffering, my energy level is suffering. I am suffering in many ways. Because every one of these false shepherds will only lead us to destruction. There are thousands of them. And Jeff in his prayer said it's so easy to follow the world. It's only easy to follow the world because that's our default position, right? Default position, follow the world. But you know what? Jesus is a good shepherd. It's just as easy to follow him if we just make the decision to do so. Oh, oh yes. Jesus wants me. I want to follow you, Jesus. You're my shepherd. Now, I want you to notice something about shepherds. They take charge. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I am thrilled with that aspect of Jesus' character. When I give him permission to do so, he gives me all kinds of freedom, you know. He lets me do anything I want, including destroy myself. But if I say to him, I'm giving you permission to be my shepherd, I want you to intervene and involve yourself in my life and keep me from destroying myself. By the way, are sheep stupid enough to destroy themselves? Yes. Yeah, that's one of the main premises of the sheep metaphor in the Bible. They are stupid enough to destroy themselves. They don't know when they're in danger, when they're in trouble. And we're all like that. So when I make the Lord my shepherd, I'm literally giving him permission to intervene in my life. Have you ever been mad at God because he took something away from you? Yes. You should have said, Hallelujah! I don't know why you need to take that away from me, but I'm absolutely sure you did because you're my shepherd and you make no mistakes. Is that the truth? Yeah. That is the truth. Oh, he takes some precious things from us sometimes. Whoa, and sometimes he lets us lose our health. I'm not blaming him for all my health problems. But, you know, sometimes he lets that happen so I can be saved. Do you believe that? He's a good shepherd. And he knows how to get us into the kingdom. I believe he can get every one of you into the kingdom. Somebody said to me just this last week, I don't think I'm going to make it. If you don't think you're going to make it, it's because you don't know how powerful your shepherd is. Give him permission every day to be your shepherd, amen? amen. He's going to get you in. He's not going to let the wolves have you. You know how much he treasures you? No, you don't. I don't either. I'm looking forward to a billion, billion years from now when I will still be learning more about how much Jesus treasures me. I don't even know what a sea of love we'll be riding on to each other. <laughs> I think we'll find out that the whole universe, you know, all that dark matter they're talking about, all that invisible matter, this kind of a sea, a soup that the universe floats in, I think we'll find out it's all love. 
The whole universe is writing in love. Oh, it's so amazing how God is caring for his children. And the shepherd metaphor is very precious because the shepherds would, well, a true shepherd, as we'll see, would even give his life for his sheep. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. <coughs> well, a, a, a good shepherd was, was the owner of the sheep. He had an investment in the sheep. They were extremely valuable commodities in the biblical time. And so it makes a metaphor of, of our value, but it's a weak metaphor. Because in fact, each of us is irreplaceable to God. And uh, so we're highly valued by him, and he would give his life and has given his life. Jesus is saying this to people who haven't a clue that he's going to die. Some of them would like to kill him. They have no idea that there'd be any redemptive factor in that. But he says, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and runs away. <laughs> well, I have the title of pastor. And you know what pastor means? And it means shepherd. And I, let me just let you know that I recognize myself to be a very poor shepherd. If I can just do one thing right, what I want to do is to direct you to the Good Shepherd. Okay? Because I recognize I can't keep the wolves away. I don't even always recognize the wolves when they come. And furthermore, I get scared too, and I want to run away myself sometimes. I don't want to be a hireling. I don't think I am. I really, truly love you and want all of you to be in heaven and want to be there with you too, very badly. But I know that I am not the shepherd that can get you there. That term pastor, I'm not sure it's wisely chosen, but the more I understand about it, the more it scares me. Because I don't know uh, anything to do except direct you to the real shepherd. Because I, I will surely fail you in some ways or other. I probably already have. A number of you have probably recognized that. And, 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 but, I, but I want you to know, I, I do love you. And it's only because Jesus is in me. Do you think we have any love of our own? No, no we don't. I love you, but it's only because Jesus is in me giving me some of his feelings for you. But I do. I, I care about your salvation. I lose sleep at night over you. I've watched several families in this church walk away from the Good Shepherd, and it just breaks my heart. I've seen some of the children now making decisions, even at their young ages, to give up on God. And it just breaks my heart. I do care, but I don't know what to do except to try to lift up Jesus before you and say, come on. You want abundant life? Jesus has it all. Jesus has it all. It's a very helpless sensation I have here. And it's helpless in two ways. One, I see God working in my ways, and I recognize I've done nothing to cause that. And the Holy Spirit is just at work, and I just sit back and say, wow, God, you're amazing. And I see the shepherd at work in your lives. I say, oh, my God, that's wonderful. And sometimes you'll say, Pastor, you really helped me. And I think, I don't think so. I think he did it all. I feel like just a lucky bystander. God bless you, brother. Don't you love seeing the Holy Spirit at work? Oh, oh. I just realized that we, we mortals who are still sinners, we, we get in the way uh, of telling the truth about Jesus so often. And so I want to direct you to the Word and, and to prayer and to a direct relationship with Jesus because if you're relying on me to, to give you everything you need to know about Jesus, I might miss something. There's one shepherd, amen? There's one true pastor of the church. So often when I pray, when we have staff meetings, and I pray with, with Pastor Dave and, and, and Brother Jeff, and we're praying about the church, and, and I'll say right there in my prayer, the Lord, you pastor this church. We're in big trouble if he doesn't, aren't we? Yeah, that's our only hope. Well, Jesus says the most amazing things. They have to either be true or they're astonishing lies. He says in verse 15, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. So the Father and I are absolutely transparent to each other. How many of you look forward to living in heaven in a completely transparent environment? Do you? I don't know. You 
know, I think it'll be fine if we're all pure, but, you know, we Americans are used to being kind of independent, aren't we? Imagine living in an environment where we are absolutely known. I'll bet if I asked you if all of you would like to be absolutely known by each other right now, not one of you would raise your hand. Because you recognize flaws in your thinking and in your feelings, don't you? And you don't want those to stick out. <laughs> but oh, the Father and the Son have always absolutely, utterly known each other. And I don't even think that they have identical personalities. I think they have slightly different personalities, but they have identical characters, amen? They have identical characters, and they know each other through and through. I, I think I really know my wife. I'm, I'm right about 18 times out of 20. Well, that's the same as 9 out of 10. Well, anyway, I, uh, I simplify that. Because uh, I, I can tell what she's gonna, how she's going to react almost every time. But she still surprises me once in a while. Absolute transparency, absolute knowingness is, is going to be possible there. But the Father and Son know each other. And what that says to me is that if Jesus gave his life for me, what would the Father do? He would give his life for me, too. In other words, the whole Trinity would give their life for me. In other words, God somehow valued us equal with himself. I, I don't even comprehend that. But that is just amazing. And he says in verse 16, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. And he's speaking to the Jews there. And so he's talking about us Gentiles. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. But I think that still holds true today, too, don't you? Does the Lord have other sheep that are not in this fold? Will he bring them? Do you want to be part of that? How soon will there be one flock and one shepherd? Don't you look forward to that? One flock and one shepherd. Shall we compromise our, our unique beliefs in order to promote that unity? Let's always review our beliefs in Scripture. But if we're on the scriptural side, folks, we cannot seek unity over truth, can we? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We cannot seek unity over truth. So I look forward to the time when he'll unite us all in one flock with one shepherd and it all be in the truth as well. But now verse 17. This is truly one of the most amazing verses in Scripture. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Now the Father didn't expect to lose Jesus permanently, did he? He says, I lay down my life that I may take it again. The Father did not expect to lose Jesus permanently, but he loved Jesus more for dying for us. I didn't think it would be possible for him to love Jesus more under any circumstances, and yet here it indicates to us that he loves Jesus, he loves the Son, because of his sacrifice for us. Now think what that's saying. Why would, it, why would that be true? He loves us so much that he loves Jesus more for dying for us. Do you really grasp that? You know what I say to Jesus? I used to say to Jesus, I love you, Jesus. And then at one point I realized that my love for Jesus was absolutely pathetic. It was, it was fickle. It was minute. It was still laced with tons of selfishness. We should tell Jesus we love him, right? Should we? Of course we should. I still tell him I love him. <coughs> But I now realize much better than I used to how pathetic that is. So I have a new thing that I say that I've been saying for a few years now. That, oh, it just, it just is so wonderful. I want to teach it to you. It's so simple and so wonderful. And it just changes my whole perspective. Instead of saying, Jesus, I love you, I say, Jesus, you love me. What do you think about that? You're looking at me like, yeah, that's weird. Yeah, you know it. But you need to say it, brother. Because when you say, Jesus, you love me, it does something to you emotionally. It does something to your heart, and it does something to your faith. And it strengthens your faith. 
Of course I can make it to heaven. Jesus loves me. I say, Father, you love me. Especially when the devil's attacking. By the way, does the devil ever attack you? Okay, does he attack you once a day? Twice a day? <laughs> Several times a day? All right. So whenever he's attacking me, I say, Father, you love me. Because invariably the devil's doing something to make me think, you know, you're hopeless, you're disgusting, you're really out of it, you're, you know. <laughs> and then I say, Father, you love me. You're not willing to lose me. Does he need to be reminded of that? No, but I need to be reminded of that. And so as I say those things, it strengthens. I'm just praising him. Is this a legitimate thing to say to God? You love me, but we're just praising him. It's all through the Psalms, you know, how great God is and how much he cares for me and how he's my guy, my shepherd, my this, my that, my everything. Tell him he loves you. Absolutely tell him he loves you. He's thrilled to hear it. He's so glad you know. Tell him you're my shepherd. You're my shepherd. You've got my life in your hands. I gave you permission. I keep giving it to you again and again. You are my shepherd. I know you're going to get me through. Amen? Amen. No matter what the cost, you've got my permission to do what's necessary. Get the job done. Get me through. He says, I give up my life. That's why my father loves me. In verse 18, he says, nobody takes it from me. Satan didn't kill him. The Pharisees didn't kill him. The Romans didn't kill him. He says, I lay it down of myself. Into thy hands, he said, I commit my spirit. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it back again. This command I have received from my Father. Wow. Imagine being able to raise yourself up to life after you're dead. Jesus said he had the power to do that. Isn't that great? <laughs> so I read this to my father in the hospital. And I shared, so I just gave a little commentary as I went down through. Probably took a half hour in there. there. <coughs> I reminded him of Jesus' power to raise himself from the dead. Well, you know, the people find he's crazy. Verse 20, many of them said, he has a demon, he's mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So they were looking at his work and saying, but, 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 he's doing things only God can do. Wow. Well, let's look down here at this a little bit more about the sheep. In verse 26, he says to the Pharisees, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Now, I don't believe in predestination in the sense that some do. I believe you can decide whether or not to be a sheep. But many of those who were there were not sheep. They had taken themselves out of the sheep category. And they were not his sheep, at least. And they would not hear his voice. Which means they were not the father's sheep either. They were not listening to God. There are people who are listening to God and there are people who are not. Out in our community, there's a number of people who are listening to God. When they hear Jesus' voice, they will recognize it and they will come. Do you believe that? Yeah. It changes the whole viewpoint of how we do evangelism. We don't go out there and try to persuade anybody to believe anything. We tell them the truth. We give them the word of Jesus Christ. We lift up Jesus before them. If they are his sheep, they will come. They will follow. They will listen. They will respond. Our only job is to show them Jesus, to speak in the voice of Jesus, to give them the truth. And they will hear it, they will recognize it, and they will kind of walk into it because they're already listening. They've already put themselves in the Jesus sheep category by the decisions they've been making in their hearts, by listening to that voice that speaks to every man in his inner mind. They are putting themselves in that category. And then when they hear the truth, they know it. I know that was true for many of you, because many of you are converts. And as soon as you heard the truth, you said, this is it, this is what I've been waiting for. Because the Spirit had already prepared you. You were already letting yourself be His sheep, and He was able to guide you into the truth. I love that understanding. The question is today, are we maintaining our sheep status? 
our Jesus sheep status. Yes. Good. We're still listening, then, huh? We're still listening. In spite of the loud voice of Satan, in spite of the distraction, in spite of the uh, temptation to say, I know all I need to know already. I don't need to listen anymore. Folks, that is a real temptation, especially as you get older and you've heard everything a million times. It's like when we have an evangelist in the church and only 10% of you come because you say, I've heard that so many times. It doesn't catch my attention. It's not interesting to me anymore. And you know what I want to say to you? You need to hear it again. It's the same old wonderful truth and you need to hear it again to stay in that sheep status and make sure you're not growing cold and make sure you're not growing deaf to the beautiful voice of the shepherd. Listen, listen, listen. The shepherd is leading you somewhere. Keep following. Has your life moved anywhere? Are you making any progress? Is anything changing in your life? If you follow the shepherd, it's inevitable that you're moving forward. He says in verse 26 again, you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Wow. Eternal life can begin today, amen? amen. You cannot, nobody can snatch them. Don't say, I don't know if I'm going to make it. You're going to make it as long as you remain a sheep. Let the shepherd lead you, amen? amen. It's a process. It's a, it's a road. It's, 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 it's forward motion. The shepherd is leading you to the kingdom. You're not jumping to the kingdom all at once. You're following the shepherd. How many of you are determined to keep following the shepherd? Do you know it's your only hope? Do you realize that? You're not good enough just because you've been having all you did. You don't know enough just because you've not learned everything six times over already. No, no, no. We still must follow the shepherd every day. Uh, Shepherd. I thank God that even when we fail to follow the shepherd sometimes, he's a good shepherd, isn't he? He comes back and finds us and takes his rod and staff after us. You ever do that to you? He's a good shepherd. But nevertheless, what fools we are not to follow him every day. Not to let every day be a day in the flock. I know he guided you here this morning. I know you're here because he's guided you here. I know that you love him. I know that you know he loves you. Be encouraged. What does he say here again? Be encouraged because why? They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Shall we say amen to that? Amen. Let's, let's just read that one more time. It's so beautiful. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That even means the devil, right? Even the devil. You are his sheep. He is holding on to you. You would have to be really determined to get away from him. But it can't happen. And no one can do it to you. Not even the devil. My Father who has given them to me is even greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus the Good Shepherd. Well, I'm just a dumb old sheep. And I need a good shepherd every day, don't you? Every day. Make sure that's your first word. Open your heart to Jesus and say, Jesus, be my shepherd now. Again. Again. More, more, more. Lead me. I don't care. I don't care what, what you lead me away from or what you lead me into. I just want to know you're leading me. Amen? That's what matters because you are going to get me the kingdom. Father in heaven, we have been convicted today. We have seen that we have had other shepherds in our experience. And they have invariably led us into suffering. We thank you so much, dear Jesus, that we can trust you. And you will get us safely through. That day by day our walk in your path grows sweeter. Jesus, thank you too for rescuing us when we have gone astray. Because you are such a precious shepherd. You take so seriously our claim on you as our shepherd. 
that when we get distracted, start moving in another direction, walking after some other shepherd, you are so precious to come and rescue us. Don't let us be presumptuous, Lord. Don't let us be foolish. Don't let us walk away from you. Remind us more quickly. I especially pray for my dear, dear church family here today, Lord, that each one will not settle for anything less than reinstituting, reconfiguring that shepherd and sheep relationship each day. Father, teach us not to rely on anything but Jesus. Not only is he the shepherd, but he is the door. And we want to enter in through him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.